Welcome, I mean, everyone. We have Andrew and Rodney so far, and we were discussing the holy grail of true ZFS-based ZFS uh, multi-boot to different operating systems. You were saying, Rodney. Um, they, the biggest initial stumbling block I ran into is either the Linux's boot to a special partition that is either... EFS4 formatted or it is a special boot pool and I think when they use a boot pool it's like a it's a ZFS 5000 with no options it's stripped down because their bootloader can't understand most of the advanced ZFS features um, by replacing all of that and using FreeBSD's booting tools um, it should allow us um, to boot Linux natively from a full-blown pool. Though there may be mod loading is completely different between the two operating systems. So I don't know if our bootloader could really load their kernel and modules. We could probably do a, a flat kernel and a an NITRD. And uh, it just... First step is finding a common, even making a ZFS pool that you can mount on both Ubuntu and FreeBSD. I mean, it's they're incompatible. Ubuntu yeah. does not like our pool. Um, we do not like Ubuntu's pool. I mean, I think I would think as a you know as a proof of concept, trying to do a dual FBSD Lumos might be. A little bit easier. Easier? <laughs> yeah, if you're already using, if, it's, if a Luminos is already using the FreeBSD loader, yeah, that would should make it. Yeah, um, world's easier. Yeah, at least, it, it, yeah. And the fact that it also, um, oh, now I lost the thought. You're using our bootloader. And you support boot, and Lumo supports boot environments. You got to realize that Ubuntu doesn't even support boot environments, even in ZFS. Or I should I shouldn't say Ubuntu. Linux doesn't support boot environments. So if Lumo is is using the same loader and supporting boot environments, it, that should actually be almost trivial. So two things. I thought the FreeBSD loader sprouted chain loading support. And there's a project called zfsbootmenu.org, which is an attempt to have a Linux-friendly boot manager. And I'll drop that in the chat. Okay. Because it's like, yeah, they, they, they know they're missing the feature. They want it. I can't blame them. And so it's gradually sprouting. And that's... Uh, I, when when so you I'm, say FreeBSD supports chain loading, I mean, the FreeBSD loader can load... FreeBSD compatible binaries, basically. So yeah, you can you can load something that's properly compiled to be loaded by our loader. We can't. I mean, um, I, I recall just the passing headline long in the last few years that it would kind of blindly load something more like a traditional, you know, what early Grub loader. But I, I'll I'll do a little research right now. Okay. Um, I mean, one way that I've done some of that is with Pixie. Mm -hmm. iPixie is really powerful in that sense, in that you can, with a fairly poorly supported crappy NIC that just supports minimal PXE, you can you can get it to bootload iPixie that then gives you scripted menus and and binary blobs that can load all sorts of stuff, including it has iPixie supports. Um, well, let me think. It it has a very rich I set of... can load dang near anything. Huh? I pixie can yeah, load dang near exactly. <laughs> and and it's it, and it's cross platform. I mean, I actually, I'm, I actually VMware have, uses iPixie for for doing their auto deploy stuff. Yes. As, yeah, it loads everything. And it and as I said, it's cross-platform. I actually have an iPixie implementation that you can um, point an ARM board at, and it will go find ARM binaries. 
did not know that. That's cool. Yeah, non-trivial, but and, and the arm binaries have to be trivial. <laughs> but yeah, right. it's it, it it is cross-platform. I believe it also runs on PowerPC. So you you could in theory build a diskless boot service server that supported FreeBSD, Ubuntu, all all the Linuxes, and all the architecture or not all the architectures at least i eighty six. 386 and AMD 64, um, ARM 32 and 64, and PowerPC 32 and 64. But it has some nuances. Um, if I recall, there's some, you can't easily identify some of the, that you're necessarily getting the ARM 64 requests so you have to do some ugly hackery with Mac detection. Then where would the ZFS live? Server side sharing that all out or a data pool at the client side if, or something else? Well, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do ZFS, I mean, it could either you, you could run ZFS over iSCSI. Um, and I can't really, well, you could, in theory, you could NFS export ZFS data sets and use, if your operating, if your, your diskless operating system supported um, NFS, you could do things that way. But I mainly, I mainly just did it to get kernels loaded for debug sure. purposes. Get a sure. kernel and a net, net RD loaded, and and either if I needed, a, if I got far enough, I needed a file system. I was pretty much done with playing with Hypixie at that point. Got it. And because then I would attach local storage and go, okay, now I can boot from local storage and do real stuff. And on the Windows side of things, when I need storage on ZFS as much as possible, I've been kind of trying to push um, using Lumos' SIF, su SIF support because the way they the way they've got that set up in the in the kernel is really nice. It gives us all of the being able to see the snapshots. Oh, like shadow copies or previous yeah, versions? They, yeah, yeah. They, they, they show up. They show up, show up in the in the shadow copies. In yeah, Windows. but what SMB level is that? One, two, three, three point something. <laughs> I would have to look. Yeah, that's been the limitation because you know, everything's competing with Samba, which tries to stay current, and FreeBSD has its own little. Uh, largely unknown SMB daemon, but it's also quite protocol limited. I want to say it's three point something or another. Oh, that's great. But it's it, it's a severely limited version of it. It only does the file sharing stuff. Samba tries to do a oh. bunch of the stuff <laughs> yep. like the the print the printer stuff and all of this. No, this is only for files. Sure. What, no Active Directory um, <laughs> server hiding in there? Yeah, no. Yeah, good, <laughs> correct. It um, does one thing. Do you know if a person or company is actively developing that, or is it still a bit of a snapshot from Sun long ago? I'm not sure offhand. Okay. Cool. And I know the one thing that you can run into with it that I've noticed is with case sensitivity. Hi, yeah. Well, I've been working on a science project for the last two days, but I'll let you <clears throat> share yours first. <laughs> 
Who's that directed at? That's said both of you. Go ahead and share what you have, and then I have something to just to talk about if you like. I think I'm done. <laughs> Aww. So, uh, FreeBSD Release Engineering has been producing weekly snapshots for quite some time, and they include virtual machine images. And at some point, I realized you can just flat those down on a hardware device and boot to it, and it will grow SS. And this then you can. Is being recorded. Oh, hello. Welcome. It's me again. Rod number two. So I, go ahead. I, it should have, everything was muted, so I don't understand why that played, but okay. That's cool. Okay, so I have a tool to uh, retrieve them and lightly configure them, but I refactored it this last two days to uncompress directly to a device rather than save it off to an image and then flat it over and grow it and do all sorts of things. But the, so the eyes on the prize goal, and hence my questions, Andrew, when we first started chatting, is that, and Rod, I think one of your phones is playing in the background. Yeah, I'm getting it. <laughs> Trying to find which one it is. One's muted for what it's worth. I think so, they're both mute. There. So the hope is to take completely stock upstream free BSD and then perhaps with a combination of say the new null FS file mounts uh, overlay everything that is air quotes local to use a traditional term. And I noticed there is like uh, loader.conf.d which lets you drop files in there and there's something called loader init script which lets you execute a script at the top level directory that I realized could do quite a bit of item potent system configuration, like modifying rc.conf and other things and possibly manipulating users. So I don't, I don't know if I can get beyond all chicken and egg issues. Like you, if you have it on ZFS, you need to well load ZFS and mount data sets and things like the init script directive in loader.conf can take care of that. But uh, I will keep pursuing this. But in the future, I hope that say FreeBSD can up, be updated with a ZFS send of either the entire base OS or at least a SBIN directory such that it just magically is instantly up to date rather than running FreeBSD update, etc. So Rodney, I, I suspect you've solve some of these issues in your own ways over the years? Um, not really. I don't, I don't update. There's that. I do, okay. I do, I, I do forklift upgrades. I just purely do not update systems. If I need the system updated, I completely nuke, pave and, and reinstall. So that does lend to this idea of just using, in this case, a weekly snapshot of current and a, a fixed script that configures it. And yep, it's a, a yep, new boot device basic. and splats it all in and off we go. I, I have a thing I called overlay.tgz that is basically all of the files that I tweak. And I can do a clean install and untar that over the top of it and reboot. and. I'm pretty much there. Got to set a host name, IP, a few other things. But other than mucking with rc.conf, that does 99.9% .9 of my install work. Do you manage users in any way such that they might add some daemons user? I only have your... one user. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I and, that's and, in the same boat. And overlay.tgg includes R. Grimes' home directory and the password entries. Oh, so it does, well, does it replace the files in Etsy for password and- Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, what do you do if say the upstream adds a user for some silly daemon that came along? Or something? Yeah, I have to create new, I, I create new versions of the overlay based on 
deal with. So in other words, when when 13.1 comes out, I take my overlay files, I install one copy of 13.1, I go in and diff my files against the base system and figure out and merge, basically do a three-way diff and merge my changes into those files and then save those off as an overlay for 13.1. Got it. So it's each time a new release comes out, it's it's a manual process. Um, and I often have to deal with things that got changed in non-backwards compatible ways. Ah, you yeah. know, like putting more back as more and not something called less. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what are the other big ones that have been annoyances? I'd have to go look at my overlay. There's There have been changes in defaults just to change the defaults because somebody else thought their defaults were better than what the defaults have been for 25 years, which... Right. Yeah, I remember I mean, when, like, yes, directory that, colors showed up one day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Things like that. I actually mucked my overlay so that it turned off color LS while it existed until I finally convinced Kyle that you didn't implement that exactly as Linux that did it. Because in Linux, I don't have colors. And in FreeBSD, I have colors. And I do nothing different between the two. And we finally found it. It's actually in, he, he looked at, I think, Ubuntu and one other thing. They yeah. actually do set an environment variable that turns color LS on. It's not on in the binary by default. Ah, <laughs> okay. And he finally went in and fixed it so that it actually works correct. And that's why color LS went away. And so now I have to, un- I have a different version of the overlay because of that. So it's there. There have been, you know, yeah. So if ninety percent of the people are making this change to the configuration, they've probably been making that change for a long time. And if we, if the base systems default change to undo it, they all have to quit making or doing whatever it is. And everybody that hasn't been doing that has to. So it's it's a double wham to the user base. So my argument is: is do we really want to screw with defaults? People have been dealing with them as they are. Yes. And that was my observation that I've changed the same damn thing for decades. It's like, well, you know, if people wanted, if people wanted color LS on their free BSD systems, they installed bin utils. Mm. You know, it wasn't rocket science. Amen. Now, instead, when, when I'm trying to build a eight megabyte image to stick on a router, I now have a bloated LS to try and deal with and have to tweak a bunch of knobs to make LS small again. Andrew, has OmniOS been pretty stable on defaults? Um, I think so. You I would mean, remember got, being burned. I, 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 I haven't been burned, but by the same token... You know, I've got my 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 install script that goes through and manually sets just a whole pile of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, I've I've I actually even refined that to be a separate package that's installed that checks it every time the system boots and resets <laughs> it. That's I I was going to mention for Michael, you were talking about ZFS ZFS send as a way to update. Yes. Images and stuff. I will I will go back to the very oldest self-updating implementation of FreeBSD I know of, and that was Julian Elsher um, at TRW Financial Services using SUP. Do you remember SUP, SUP? Oh, boy. Um, Which was, we used to distribute yeah. the CVS tree via SUP. CVS SUP? CVS, CVS SUP, yes. Yeah, yes. Definitely. Okay. Well, that, yeah. the underlying protocol is software. Uh, SUP is software update protocol or something like that. Anyway, TRW's whole FreeBSD infrastructure and OSF1 and something else were using SUP so that at boot time, it would go look for an update and it would pull new binaries over and reboot again. Did it have any notion of configuration or simply static yes. binaries in a directory? No, it would, no, it, it kind of merge it, it mastery had, type thing. Yes. Ah, 
Okay. And well, and and they're they're it's a centralized control environment. So they were all of these workstations were all of all the same, and so mm -hmm. configuration files came from the server. Okay. Including host name based etcrc files. So now so there was there, so there was some mucking around with FreeBSD, but it was a completely automated. You, you'd watch you'd watch a machine go from one version to the next version during a reboot. Now I may have slightly led you astray there, Michael, yeah. because I didn't understand what you were asking for it for. <laughs> okay, cool. So while we do use kind of a ZFS send thing that's used for the initial install. From that point on, what, what they do is they'll take a B, they'll take a separate, a separate BE snapshot and mount that and use package to do updates to it. And then when you next reboot it, you reboot into the new BE. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, but packages are also upstream such that, you know, if we create the user Andrew H, I, none of us want for Andrew to vanish during an update. Yeah, well, but, but the, the, I mean, the packages don't affect, well, I mean, they do affect the password file, but it does it by adding this. It, it doesn't remove okay. your user users from your, your users from it. And that's. I can't dig into. I, I can't speak too deeply on that. I just know that it's never removed any additional users we've created. So presumably, it would like modify with PW or yeah, that uh, user yeah. or something, as it should. I mean, so and that's what like FreeBSD has sprouted I, something called SysRC, which allows you to carefully, idempotently, safely modify certain configuration files, which is nice. And you can just you know say I yeah, want it to I, end up here. Go ahead. I believe package has password management tools built into it. it or, I believe you. I shouldn't say that. management. I shouldn't say management. It has add user tools built into it. Yeah, I believe you are correct in that, and I think that's how it's it's done. I don't do. Pa I don't make packages that often, but I know how. I, um, let me look on a. I think does it actually invoke add user? Mm. For you know, I, I want to say there's an there's a there's a set of things in the the XML for the uh, package manifest that that create it, but I don't know how the code actually works. Yeah, it actually invokes add user, or at least it fakes it good enough that var um, var log user log contains entries for users added by package. Okay. Because if, if you go look at that and you, you can see when your bulk package installed RAM because you can see it adding to all the stupid thing like cups and pull kit and color D and get daemon and DHCPD and- and please they aren't trying to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> So my guess is it just uses add user command line to do it all in one. I think you can specify every parameter on the command line. Maybe not. No, nope, you can't. Uh, password, I'm not sure if that can be done, but you can slam it into PW. Well, add oh, user can... Almost, it'll take the... Uh, for almost all those, those are going to be locked accounts anyway. They won't have right. a well, password. True. Well, yeah. Uh, Rodney SUP protocol. What do you was it ever in base and did it? Yes. Just oh, yeah. See, even, CVS I think up, even I, do recall. I believe CVS SUP was in base. The what SUP protocol is public out of MIT, I believe. And it's cross platform. As far as I know, OpenNet and FreeBSD all have the SUP binary support. Hmm. Um, you know why it fell out of fashion? Uh, Git. Well, they haven't been updating users. CVS, CVS up still works against the old repositories. 
Okay. The only reason that CVS SUP is no longer in base is because we now use Git. And so there's no need for it. There is a package. Okay. A binary CVS up static 16.1H. And I don't know. SUP 2.020 is yeah, CMU. Software update protocol. And that's just that's the raw SUP without the CVS intelligence stuck into it. And so was it an uh, anomaly that uh, Julian was using it for the actual base OS or was that, you know, it, you were, they were using it for binaries, not just source management, correct? Correct. So were they, so was, so, so was CMU, so was okay. CMU who wrote the, the software. Carnegie Mellon University yep. used to yep. use this to manage their machines with. Hmm. You probably can find some Google history on if you do CMU SUP. Yep. Nope, stand up paddleboard package. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. Yep, there you go. Colorado Mesa say, University, of course. Yeah. Uh, right, Carnegie funny. Mellon supplemental essay. <laughs> yeah. Google computer. The subsystem is separated by a collection of files. Yeah, there it is. It's about four down called sub.doc. And what? There's no upstream link in the port. Hmm. Okay, sub. Well, yeah, it's probably. There it is. Oh, it's, yeah, it's an open office document. Anyway, that's a. I mean, rsync is probably more effective. But so, right. well, no, the interesting thing about SUP is it actually has more flexible configuration files for what it will and what it is and is not going to update. Yeah, our thing don't care. <laughs> yeah, our thing is basically wants to make everything match. And yep. SUP can actually have things be different. <clears throat> Hmm. Some very bad experiences with our sync by putting the wrong <laughs> options. <laughs> yeah, there's been a trailing slash. So so much so that I don't even install it anymore. <laughs> okay. I don't use our sync at all anymore. I've there curdled. Are, there too, are, I've curdled too many things with it. <laughs> there are two commands that I absolutely quadruple check. All of my options are <laughs> one of them is our sync. The other one is DD. Yep. I have okay. The the, the I, I pulled the, the CMU doc on SUP. It it predates BS free BSD. It was actually done in 1989. I'm pretty sure that this was um part of the OSF one. Or excuse me, um mock. Oh yeah, okay. This was part of the mock tool set. Hmm. It's pretty rich. Boy, I forgot about all these features. So I think I'm I'm blocking out memories of how one updated FreeBSD prior to FreeBSD update, which I will point out is a good patch level it's, updater, but it's a terrible full OS updater. I mean, you don't remember how we used to update FreeBSD before? Well, a complete build world and friends, but but mm -hmm. beyond that, what did end users do? Innocent. Remember the package kit? <laughs> Uh, come on there before those tools there really wasn't anything yeah mm. build world yeah granted yep uh, so is a ZFS based OS 
in our, you know, like installation strategy and update strategy in the, you know, reasonable near term future? Or is that just a dream well, we'll have for another decade or two? Well, I mean, ZFSN is kind of heavyweight in that you're going to, I mean, <sighs> it's just a block image. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You might as well use DD. Well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I won't be updating my, or should never touch my SBIN directory. I simply want that to be upstream and yeah, local I'll tinker with, but uh, along the theme of production users wanting the host to suspend guests, quickly update and jump right back into service. Things like having a send update your mm, yeah. SBIN directory in an instant as opposed to okay, well, you're missing compare all the files. Let's compare this, run up, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. reinvent the you're... wheel every time. <laughs> you might want to look at how the industry has dealt with that in the ESXi and other CentOS, uh, not CentOS, what's the um uh what's the Linux hypervisor outfit? No, well, Proxmox, I don't know if they do it people that have live migration abilities the, yep. the way that you deal with updating servers is you migrate all of the vms off of a server to another server and then do a forklift well, and then yeah, migrate yeah. them back that's how the industry has decided to solve this problem you don't try and go oh i'm going to shut my vms down for a minute because you can't you're not allowed hmm. to okay there That's is how I'm need. planning on working with almost all my stuff in VMware too. Is move everything. Migrate it. Yeah, move everything off onto one of the other hosts. Update yep. the host. Hmm. Yep. Okay. And that's basically how all of the large commercial industry has solved the update of the host problem. That's and and that's why uh, the discussions we've been having about having some kind of migration strategy in Beehive is so yes. interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Having live migration in Beehive would give put put Beehive on par in the upgradability aspect as the commercial hypervisor platforms. Mm -hmm. And until we until we get that, we're, we will be in this predicament of VMs are going to have downtimes to do an upgrade. Yeah, I mean, because right, you know, right now I've got it to where, you know, the downtime for a VM is the amount of time it takes to reboot the host, but it still exists. Right. Yep. I mean, my my VM down in Corvallis was pushing four years without a reboot but had been through two platform upgrades oh i see between two machines oh i or i don't know how many machines were involved it well, went through two two upgrades of esxi in their cluster the last one required a reboot i see there was I, I, it required me to reboot my guests because they they evidently their newest cluster did not allow them to live migrate from the old cluster. There were some issues. I think they went too many revisions or something, or there were VM incompatibilities, and mm -hmm. um, you couldn't you couldn't live migrate. So they had oh. to do a cold. They had to do a cold migrate. Which was which, which was almost instant because they use this, their back end is a sand storage and the sand was ex accessible, but there was something with the host side of it that they couldn't just do a migrate. Could they have jumped too many CPU generations? That, that could be the other thing. There are there are certain there are certain things within ESXi that prevent you from doing a V motion. Sure, they happened to hit one of them. Yeah, and. It's hard to. You have to do frequent hardware upgrades to not occasionally run into those snags. 
So are there legends told of the longest running virtual machines that have traveled to hell and back without interruption? Not that I know of. I mean, <laughs> what are your personal records? You said three years? Almost four years. No, almost four years. He's got yeah. me deep. And, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest there. <laughs> Mine are usually a few minutes. So, yeah, you. <laughs> and it went, there's some weird anomalies that happen during V motion and stuff. Like NTP is not happy. Hmm, yeah. Because V motion causes some weird things to go on with. CPU responsiveness. I know. I, I know. I've had ones in excess, easily in excess of a year. Hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. That's. So. Then again, we don't we don't upgrade hardware that often either. I'm I'm in the midst of of dealing with some hardware upgrades now, moving stuff from like ancient Intel stuff to stuff that came out, some stuff that came out last year. Because we're trying to do some more efficient use of electricity. Well, you're catching every little detail down there, Dexter. Uh, a great man once said that if this information is not shared or is lost, minutes after the call when it exits our heads it's it's a disservice to the greater community that's my way of blaming you for motivating yeah i know record <laughs> to document because we've yeah. had some that's great discussions on like ntp and all the when the when the project started that was one of the underlying pushes to go we're going to do everything in email no chat servers, no instant messengers, all of that stuff. We would like to keep everything in email because we can archive it all. Mm -hmm. And so you can go back and look at it. You can search it. You can find out about. I'm trying to find. Um, I believe that. VMware may have this NTP partially addressed, I think. I think there, I thought there was a KB article on it. Have you ever had a VMware infrastructure and almost everything, there's a V motion happening, the NTP daemon on the guest just goes boing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wrong time after V motion. Well, when NTP is enough trouble on a standard host on standard hardware clock yeah. and standard yeah. network, it's like, yeah, good luck on a VM. Uh, but motion and NTP drift. There you go. Okay. Oh, there's all sorts of articles yeah. about. Um, but I don't know that anybody. They actually have some really good white papers on what the problem is and why there's a problem even between a host and a guest and and things like NTP. And they've hmm. actually, um, ESXi is a, a, one of the only hypervisors that I know of that you can re pretty reliably, as long as you're not doing things like vMotion, um, run NTP inside of. And even with vMotion, NTP tends to, it just, it gets a few anomalies and tends to recover now. Hmm. It used to be horrible. It would bounce all over the place and everything and, and take a long time to, to recover. But now it's pretty quick. Well, I, mean, yeah, I, can't. I, can, I was going to say my concern with that is why my NTP servers all run on physical hardware. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have four name servers running NTP in VMs on ESXi, and I've actually been very impressed at how well they do. Hmm. Like I say, as long as you're not vMotioning or, or doing other things like 
seriously over prescribing over subscribing your storage or cpus uh, it works pretty reliably now vmware did a lot of work making sure that the clock code your interrupts to your guests are properly timed well other than people saying what's the server doing nothing can we shut it down? And me having to say, no, you cannot shut down my time servers. <laughs> they are not just doing nothing. Ian, they are handing time out to our entire organization. Tell you, that's the most important counter in the building. It's counting microseconds. Other, th other than that, I'm happy with them. And uh, I think I'm going to keep them as just physical boxes. How big uh, of a physical box are you running on? Oh, uh, they're they're just like a little one U machine. They're not very powerful. Yeah, I'm, a lot of people are using things like Raspberry Pis or. I've thought about about doing that, getting getting like a, a Raspberry Pi with. Um, <clears throat> With uh, GPS chip or something, yeah, GPS uh, GPS card on it. Yeah, yeah, I've considered that because that's like two hundred bucks, and now you're a Strata one, and you're also eight watts or so. Well, that too. <laughs> I will eventually end up bringing that to my boss, who will be happy to lower the power supply. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a, a, a reasonable way to justify the two hundred dollars. Oh yeah, is the, I, is the greenness of the solution. When I'm to the point that I want to put in the effort to do it. Yeah, I've got the parts. Um, there's also TimeMachines.com, which has dedicated little appliances. So at least you know, have the yeah. power reduction. We hope, but they're probably proprietary. Is it well? Is it where Warner used to work? Well, never heard that. Maybe. Okay, he worked for one of the timekeeping outfits when the project first started. That's what Warner was doing. Hmm. Don't try VI navigation commands in Google Docs. <laughs> <laughs> J J J. What? Yeah, <laughs> that's not going to work. Uh, yeah, I do that. I do that more often than I care to count. <laughs> Sorry. Usually it's trying to quit and save for me. Exactly. What's this? With VI colon commands. Colon WQ. WQ. In the middle of a word doc. Yeah. But... <laughs> Not to change the subject. It um, might be interesting to run a Google search for colon WQ. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Unrelated, but yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> mm, and there's a WQ framework. <laughs> uh, so you're suggesting one of these appliance vendors might have been FreeBSD based? Um, yeah, might have been. Products. I'm looking at time machines. TM one thousand A. Three hundred bucks from memory. I don't know. I could be huh? How, what kind of money for such things? Oh, they should, oh time oh not timemachines.com. Oh, that's just a spam domain. Timemachinescorp.com. Mm, bummer. Time machines. Ah. Best name ever, by the way. Just saying. Fix that in a minute. Corp.com. Oh, they got some cool stuff in here. Is that Comic Sans or closing? <laughs> TM 1000A.
350 bucks. Yes. Okay, eBay.com. TM1000. <laughs> How much? What are they really? Uh, let's see. Hmm. RFC RFC is your guidelines for defining packet timestamps has an author of Warner Losh on it. It can't be. Worked on the protocol. Hmm. Oh, April 12, 2020, huh? Something screwed up. This also thanks Russ Housley, Yuck Theme, Greg Miskey, Warner Losh, Rodney Cummings, Miss Clove, Luke no, Finnis Riley, Ben Kudak, Ian Sweet, NTP I working group for the 2006 document, but also the NTP task force. Hmm. Yeah, I'm. I I just why can't I remember the name of the company? I'm certain he worked at a at a company that made small embedded timekeeping equipment, much like what you're looking at. In fact, it may have been. Time machines. Hmm. Don't know. Okay, where did that typing go to? Oh, hmm. Hmm, thank you, ULE. <clears throat> Uh, interview with Horner Lodge, the hidden early history of Unix. Horner Lodge will give a talk about the er hidden early history of Linux. I've worked on high precision time and frequency systems that measure the atomic. So, Benedict Rusley and Alan G speak with Horner Lodge about Unix history and its interesting tidbits. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, that's why you see him around the embedded small computer. Sure. Ah. Let me see. Yeah, I see the biography mentions, but not a company for high precision devices. Okay, well, that, that box is getting something screwy. Zoom's probably eating my CPU. On what OS? FreeBSD. Oh, oh, to the browser, I take it? Yep. And which browser is that? Firefox? Firefox with a okay. with a version report header hack. Faking its ID, its, its fingerprint. Yep. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. 2.6% mm, idle on four cores. Not good. <laughs> yep. Firefox is yep, basically burning... One, two, three, four, five, six cores up. I'm yep. impressed it's working at all. <laughs> Along with the my... audio, the audio is coming to you via Android. <laughs> but that was what was causing the, the double echo oh. earlier was <laughs> I had opened 
I always join first with my phone and then I open the desktop version to get in. That way I can see the share on something larger than a little teeny phone screen. Pro tip, you can open the Google Doc separately and it might use less CPU, but hey. Yeah, but if somebody shares something other than the Google Doc, I can't see it, so. This is true. That, so, there have been a couple demos. Anyway, we're just burning Warner time. Beyond history with high precision time devices, um, any uh, magic wand wish list items for the coming year and in FreeBSD land, FreeBSD 14. Rodney, I don't know if you've seen a doc of sort of tracking features that hopefully will land related to Beehive and such. I'll drop it in chat. But, um, live migration. Live migration. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Andrew. Magic wand wish list items for the next version of Illumos. Um, for be having Illumos. Yep. Live migration. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Don't be sorry. <laughs> if, if, if there's one thing I can have, that's it. Got it. Well, how good is the cold migration now? You mean shut down the VM and <laughs> carry it over somewhere? Like, well, that? no, no. We have they the Budapest people did a freeze the VM, copy all the stuff over, unfreeze, and thaw the VM. That's not live migration. That's that's cold. Mm. The VStack or, people are nudging that along, and I that's worth an update from them. Okay, it just genuine production users who very much want such things to happen. And anyway, how come this call has dwindled to four people? I think it's just because the, we're which two of our main. <laughs> the ho it's a holiday. Yeah, Is yeah it it's because always of the holiday. Yeah. Okay. And I was a bit late on the announcement being on the road, but I think it's purely holiday. Yeah, okay. So yeah. I mean, that's why I did Toward them, others can catch up later, not participate, but at least catch up, like magic. I'm afraid our signal to noise ratio is pretty poor. Well, if it's a mantra of live migration in 2023, then that's adequate signal. <laughs> Message loud and clear received. That was a broken sentence. Um, well, gentlemen, what is it? The other, I guess another thing would be the memory pressure against ZFS. Has that ever been addressed, or is it still people are manually going? I've got to restrict the size of my Z pool. That needs solved. That's just uh, yeah. That's the number one like finger burner early on. Uh, so yeah, Jan, you can see in the minutes. Jan proposed a notion of wow, centralized sort of requests that nudge the arc around and. Yevgenian and production commented, yeah, like constantly bootstorm requesting a whole bunch of changes. No. So that that's Rod, do you have a vision for how that can be solved? Well, it, it, if I arc back to the days of operating system design and implementation, one of the core functionalities of an operating system is resource management. Mm -hmm. And we forgot how to resource manage our memory. The operating system no longer has the proper tools in place such that memory is properly managed as a resource. Did you say no longer? What were the mechanisms of days gone by? there was a well in the very early days you just had malik and malik would come back and tell you no you can't have any memory because there isn't any more memory to give you <laughs> okay fair enough okay and um 
applications used to deal with that. But now it seems like nothing gets errors. That No, there's no more memory. Well, we're just going to keep trying to go. ZFS ARC can request as much of the memory as it wants. And it does so at boot time, taking 80% of the memory. Is that the, still the default? It's probably still the default. I know we put a, a cap on it. Okay. And... And by we, I don't if, mean Lumos, I mean Prominic. Okay. I need right. to clarify that. If And if somebody else comes along and says, I want 40% of physical memory, what happens? My understanding is they get told no. No. And we have a VM system. It goes, oh, yeah, okay. I can give that to you. Oop, better have a swap oh, yeah. file. Yeah. And we start swapping. And then what happens when we run out of swap? We, we have this it. stupid thing called an OOM that starts killing things. That just starts oh, yes. arbitrarily terminating processes. I do not call that resource management. Agreed. Because it literally may kill the most important thing in the system. There's a few protected binaries, but it may kill... I've seen kill it kill the... pretty, pretty important stuff. <laughs> yeah, so have I. Um, so particularly particularly I, in the Linux world, I've seen it kill core yeah. parts of the OS. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I... In, in the old days, I mean, there were more than likely you would see a failure at process startup instead of a failure way down the road in the middle of something running. Because now when we make those big memory allocations, the VM system is is lazy. It's all lazy allocations. So, oh yeah, you can have that. I'll get it later. Yep. And there isn't, there is some notions, but it's manual user intervention. And it's things like, Oh, well, you got to tweak the arc size. And if you're smart, you run all your VMs with wired memory so that when they start, if the physical memory isn't there to give them, they fail to start. And I don't know why that's just not default. Memory overcommit in Beehive or any other hypervisor is just nasty. Fortunately, you can drive down the arc, unlike the good old days where it was a one-way trip up and only a reboot with carefully crafted and calculated loader entries will get yeah, you but your memory back. We've created another foot shooter in that we can now create, if I've got 64 gig of memory in a machine, I can create eight VMs all wanting 16 gig. And nothing stops me from doing that. No warning, no nothing. It just, yeah, okay, fine. Sure. Go ahead. Sure, sure, sure. You've, you've, you've just requested 128 gig of memory on a 64 gig machine. When those guests start consuming that memory, you're going to have a bad time. Because I hope you got about 64 gig of swap and a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean a lot of patience, because it's going to take you a long time to manually wind those VMs down, because it really, it trashes. Yeah. So should the ARC, well, I, I do recall proposals to say, oh, for the ARC and certain the subsystem get merged on a previous D, and it's no longer ZFS and yeah, myself. For certain things like the ARC, virtual machines guest memory. Um, probably network buffers are already wired memory if I remember right so I was, I was going to say networking and file system buffering in the kernel and stuff those should be hard wired committed memory and I mean, the arc, the arc should probably be instead of, it would be nice to add an arc tunable that instead of telling it how much physical memory to take, 
tell it what percentage it adjust the 80 percent instead of going okay i see i got 32 gig in this machine so that means my art can go to about six gig and i'll be great just say take 20 percent of memory and be done with it uh, even a human readable entry like four gig <laughs> would be nice instead of calculating yeah. pages. like oh yeah. i think you can get and i do have syntax for that but no it's not I think by default it will not take a human readable value. Go ahead. Oh, I thought that, that you could use what's that stupid library? There's a library. Can you export sys controls as JSON or something? Maybe. <laughs> I don't. I, oh, and what JQ or what? I thought maybe SysControl grew a human, a human readable option like many of the other utilities have. And that's one way to solve your, give me a value that's readable. No, you can do dash X to print it in hex. <laughs> and dash. Um, so here's a crazy idea. The earliest Beehive had completely resolve, reserved host memory and then virtual machines on top of that not unlike zen would it be in any way wise to bring back the ability to say okay the host has this memory space the vms have this memory space and never shall they meet mm. I, I mean, you can wow. you can still run into the problem that that we were talking about earlier where you know you, you spin up 16 VMs and only have enough memory for eight. Yeah, that's overcommit. Sure. That that sure. can actually be that's easier to address in some aspects. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of saying no, you can't do that. Yeah, it might make sense to have a, a, a physical memory cap on Beehive, just like there's a physical memory cap on the Arc. Oh, yeah. Uh, beehive globally or each individual process calculated centrally with a whole big contraption. Well, I'm talking about globally because you're, you're the resource you're talking about managing is the physical memory availability. Yep. There's just certain things that you don't want to end up in an overcommitted situation. Other things, it's fine to overcommit it because you only ever use a small percentage of it. Yep. I mean, mm. the MBUF the MBUF cache comes to mind because it can grow and shrink pretty dynamically and not affect you very much unless you're doing, unless you're trying to run BGP four full routing tables. And if you don't have enough MBUF space to store the routing table, it used to blow up on you or not. Well, there's routes are stored in what are called NMB pages, which is the overall limit of the network memory. Rodney, could you briefly describe how VMware handles maximum vCPUs such that there may be pre-reserved but only lit up on demand or something? Well, that's the dynamic on-demand CPUs in a per VM thing where each VM can have a maximum virtual CPU count and you can add or remove CPUs up to that count. And each individual VM has an upper limit. And I don't but know the, where we, I, from reading some reviews and commit changes and stuff, I believe I had that in my initial topology values. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's been re removed and made a single global for all VMs. So, so I can't create, I can no longer create a VM that has a max, a max vCPU of 16 and a different one that has a max vCPU of only eight. Well, so the, does the V, does the virtual machine see those cores at boot time or does the no, no. operator manage them externally? They are managed through a, the dynamic CPU add and remove, which is part of the hot plug and play. Okay. Or hot plug. Just like PCIe is hot plug. Sure. Which means you need an OS that supports CPU hot plug. Yes.
I know personally that's not been a feature I've ever messed with. Yeah, it's a really esoteric feature. Um, is there an OS that it works routinely on and flawlessly? And I don't mean a mainframe that we don't have access to. I believe Linux supports it. Yep. Okay. Docs.kernel.org, CPU hot plug in the kernel. CPU hot plug uses a trivial state machine with a linear state space from CPU HP offline to CPU HP online. Each state has a startup and teardown callback. Hmm. Oh, so CPU in front of you, drop it in plug. The uh, well, it's just a Google search for CPU hot yeah, plug. Fine. Yeah. With one answer. <laughs> Doing that. Uh... Linux CPU plug D daemon, also called hot plug daemon, can control the amount of CPUs and memory available for a guest by adding or removing these resources. There's also memory hot plug. So Linux definitely supports this. Cool. And evidently arm.com, developer.arm.com has a reference. And it looks like QAMU supports it. And it looks like VirtualBox supports it. Yep. And definitely VMware. So as a client oh, guest OS, it's sounding like Linux or Linux. Uh, mm, yeah. Yeah, I, it, I mean, it's useful where you're doing, you have some virtual machine that suddenly runs out of CPUs. You can call up your provider and go, I need to buy four more CPUs for that VM. And they can just go click, 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 and boom, you've got four more CPUs, no reboot required. and. You crunch your job, pay your bill, and go, oh, I don't need all of those anymore, and have them remove them. Switch them off. Uh, here's a matrix of supported OS. Windows Server, no surprise. Yeah. yeah. Windows 7, 8, 10. Okay, well, here that we go. That does surprise me. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll paste it right here. Overt. I mean, that doesn't generally seem like a feature, feature that would be that useful in the workstation OSs. Uh, when Windows is limited to like two, well, we got you got to realize there's there's there are enterprises that run everything on Windows. Yeah, yeah so, that's true. And you got to realize if Microsoft had to write it for Windows Server, it's trivial for them to put it in Windows sure. eight eight seven eight ten. Yeah, that's fair. But what's surprising is it is in seven. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't expect them to do it because I expected them to want to charge for it. Yeah. It hurts up. Windows. Hot place view server generally. Can anybody hot place view without crashing the Windows server for 2090? <laughs> Support and working may be two different sets. Because I'm seeing people reporting crash problems with Windows on ESXi and Hotplug. 
And I I don't I think you didn't read the full table. Windows 7 says only in enterprise or ultimate ah. and it is only hot plug, not unplug. Ah, okay. That makes a lot more sense to me. And it's yeah, it's only the enterprise or the ultimate version of Windows 7 that has the support. And the same is true in Windows 8. And it's only excuse me. Yeah, we'll even narrow it more. It's only Windows 7 Enterprise Ultimate X864 that supports it. Windows 8 actually has it on 32-bit. And 64-bit, and Windows 10 has it on 32 and 64-bit. But none of them support Unplug, so hmm. it's add-only. And my guess would be that's, you know, for people that are running things like IIS on... Windows sure. in a VM because I believe hmm. you can you can still run things like IIS on Windows eight and ten. You don't have to have server to run those. Rodney, do you recall any rumblings of people wanting that on? FreeBSD as a guest OS. I see a, a ancient mailing list question like, hey, do you support this? And it's like, no, not really. Not that I can think of. I have not seen, I haven't seen any requests for hot plug support in native FreeBSD as a as a guest. But as or a even on real even on real hardware. I mean, at what point does that become Right. People trying to run FreeBSD as a hypervisor support platform on real hardware may someday want hot plug CPU support because they, they want to run it on things. But until you get, you know, a Amazon or DigitalOcean using FreeBSD hypervisor on sufficiently advanced hardware to even have that support. Well, I think on real hardware, when you're talking about doing this at a hyper, when we're talking about doing this at a high, as a hypervisor, I think it becomes. If you're talking about the the the, the host OS supporting it, I think it becomes less interesting because you know, like we talked about earlier, just migrate it to another machine, slap in another host, and call it a day. I mean, Behive doesn't support that now, but if it did. Assuming I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying. Yeah, I it's I don't even know the hardware that supports it. I think I've heard of some, but it's obscure mainframe crap. <laughs> like I I I want to say some of the old mm -hmm. IBM mainframe stuff supported it. Yeah, the Z series, right? Probably. Rod, was it Sequent in Oregon that did the massive SMP i386? Yes. Yeah, Lewis and Clark had one. And maybe it had this one of his claims was hey, you can pull components on the fly. Where are they now? I don't know who bought them. They're probably in Hillsboro. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Was a computer company. Was <laughs> was 1999. Has it been that long? Oh, yes, sir. Acquired IBM. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. When did the Z series stuff start coming out? I have no idea. <laughs> I can look it up though. Off topic. Off topic. Yeah. So we're at an hour and fifteen minutes. Any other thoughts? Cut ideas? the recording. <laughs>
<laughs> well, then let's just do a little goodbye for the recording. But yeah, we can chat for a little bit longer. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. And talk to you in January.